Hi guys, I'm Scott Rice, and I'm asking for your donation to support a TV show that will help make the world a safer, healthier place. The universe really is the ultimate unknown. We are in the midst of a mass extinction. Now more than ever, scientists are heroes. This show is about why. A cure for cancer is what a lot of us are working towards. Go behind the scenes of groundbreaking research. We have to go through a cloud of junk to get off of the planet. Discover a sense of wonder and respect for nature. In the animal kingdom, zombies truly are real. Explore values like diversity and inclusion and perseverance. Tony failed a lot. Be inspired to change your world. Welcome to Hot Science, a show that makes science fun and for everyone. With your support, Hot Science will help a generation of young people get excited about the sciences, boosting our nation's 21st century workforce. And it will help combat global crises like climate change, disease, and hunger by promoting science literacy to everyone. Hot Science is an ongoing production of Matthew McConaughey's Script to Screen class at the University of Texas at Austin. Students help produce, shoot, and edit the show. Your donation will put 10 and a half hours of content on national PBS stations and online at hotscience.tv for years to come. Your generosity also supports the nationally recognized speaker series, Hot Science Cool Talks. Organized by Dr. Jay Banner and UT's Environmental Science Institute, the 20-year program offers immersive, hands-on educational experiences. Help improve public science literacy and K-12 STEM education by making science heroic with Hot Science and Hot Science Cool Talks. Thanks for watching and thank you for your support. Welcome everyone to Hot Science at Home. We're so glad you can join us tonight. And thanks for watching that video about a new TV series we are attempting to produce and can use your support for. So thanks for watching that. This is through the Horn Razor at UT, so you could just Google that if you didn't get the link. And I'm proud to announce, as of today, we're right around $18,000 raised. So thank you guys so much, those of you who have, who have contributed to that. And for tonight, I want to let you know that UT Austin's Environmental Science Institute is very proud to bring you the latest and coolest advancements in science through Hot Science at Home. I'd like to share a quote from one of one of my favorite quotes about science by a scientist. It's, the good thing about science is that it's true, whether or not you believe in it. I also want to offer special thanks tonight to our newest sponsor, HEB. And we'd like to welcome everyone who's watching on YouTube and on Facebook. All right, well, I am delighted to welcome back to Hot Science, Rebecca Lewis, who is an awesome scientist. Professor Lewis is a biological anthropologist at the University of Texas at Austin, and she's an expert in the social behavior of primates. That's the group of creatures that includes monkeys, apes, humans, and of course, lemurs. As part of her research, she founded and directs the Lemur Research Station in Madagascar. Professor Lewis grew up reading National Geographic magazines and watching nature shows, uh, Jane Goodall with the chimps and Diane Fossey with the gorillas, by the time she was eight, she knew she wanted to study primates. Well, we encourage you to enter your questions at any time, and we'll ask as many of them as possible during our Q&A with Professor Lewis right after the presentation. You can submit your questions through Facebook or the YouTube comments section. So welcome back, Professor Lewis, and uh, tell us about yourself. You're a biological anthropologist who Research is lemurs in Madagascar. So many interesting layers there. What, is, what does that all mean? Great, thanks Jay, and thanks to ESI for having me. Um, yeah, biological anthropology is the study of humans within the context of other living things. And my specialty within biological anthropology is primatology. Um, if we could get the first slide. In particular, 
I study um, a group of primates called lemurs. And there are more than a hundred different kinds of lemurs and all kinds of different shapes and sizes, um, including uh, some of the smallest primates in the world. That picture up at the upper left corner there, the lemur, uh, the right under the word lemurs is a mouse lemur and they can fit in the palm of your hands. They're so small. And um, um, if we could get the next slide, um, I'll show you where they live. Lemurs live in Madagascar. And Madagascar is an island off the coast of Africa. And it looks like this little tiny island there, but it's actually the size of California. It's the fourth largest island in the world. So lemurs are found in Madagascar in this fourth largest island in the world. And you can see I'm here in Austin and um, it's a long ways away from Madagascar. So before I can even do my research, I have to travel for 55 hours straight um, at a minimum just to get to my field site before I can even do my research. Um, but um, if I could get the next slide, um, even with all this traveling um, and trekking around the world to get to my uh, to get to Madagascar, it may be exhausting. But this is one of the fun things about being a primatologist: is getting to travel and see new places. And I've been working in Madagascar with wild lemurs for 26 years now. And I've worked in the rainforest. Um, I've worked in the spiny desert. I've worked with um, the largest living lemurs, the injury, and some of the smallest ones. You see me holding um, a fat-tailed dwarf lemur there that um, was some of my work with the small nocturnal lemur, lemur, excuse me. If I could get the next slide. Um, I worked all over the island, but for the last 15 years, I have uh, been focusing my research at the Ankuchifaka Research Station in the Karindi Mate National Park. And, um, I, I established this research station about 15 years ago, and you can see it's got some buildings and solar panels. Researchers live in tents. We eat beans and rice. Um, there's, um, there's all kinds of things at this station, everything we need to do our research, including um, you can see in the corner there, there's a picture of a tall ladder. That's a six meter tall ladder that if we want to get access to cell service, because there's cell towers on either side of the forest, we can climb up this really tall ladder and hold our cell phones up high and get a signal and even be connected to the rest of the world. So we have what we need to be able to do to do our research at this site. If I can get the next slide. Um, the way we do research on um, lemurs at this field station um, is uh, with radio tracking, if I, yeah, there we go. Um, so in order to be able to find the lemurs, um, cause I have to find them in the forest. Um, one of the things I do is put a radio collar, like you can see on the she fought Chloe there has that radio collar. And I put a radio collar on them so we can find them in the middle of the forest. And the way I uh, get that collar on is I work with this amazing Malagasy darter. You can see a Nafa here um, with the blowgun. And he um, he will help me sedate the lemurs with this uh, blowgun. We'll um, catch them when they fall uh, from the trees because they're sedated. We'll catch them in a, a bed sheet. And then um, I can put the collar on them. I can weigh them and take other measurements on them. And then uh, when they wake up from the anesthesia, they can um, go back out into uh, the forest with their friends and family. Next slide. And, um, and I can collect behavioral data on them. Um, but it's really important to um, keep in mind that research is a team effort. Um, I am a professor here at UT. And so um, the majority of the year, I cannot be in Madagascar because I'm teaching classes and working with UT students here. Um, but it's a team effort collecting data in Madagascar. There are US students and Malagasy students and students from other countries. Uh, there are local research assistants um, and there are volunteers that help out with this project, including you see Melanie here. She's a high school biology teacher here in Austin. And she came with me one year and helped to habituate that group that um, you saw Chloe with the radio callers. She helped me habituate uh, Chloe and the rest of the group to get used to 
um, human observers. And so, I mean, it's a real team effort to study the lemurs. Wow, Rebecca. So 26 years, 55 hours a trip, dodging people with blowguns, having a poor <laughs> It sounds like pretty otherworldly. So you study a particular species of lemurs. Can you tell us a little bit something about what makes that species so interesting? Yeah, shifak are amazing. And uh, what I think I'll start by telling you about is why shifak um, have the name that they do. And so um, the shifak make a vocalization. Um, it's an it's an alarm call um, and they make this vocalization uh, when they are agitated and it sounds kind of like this. It sounds like And so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play a video for you that, uh, that shows a little bit of that vocalization. What you're gonna see here is there is a, a harrier hawk. One of their predators has um, just landed nearby this group that I was watching and you're gonna hear them make um, their alarm call and you're gonna hear that chipa call, and then you're also gonna hear the, the hawk calling in the background as well. So if we could get that video. Agitated by um, by having this predator nearby so that they're making the alarm call, the cheap box sound. Hopefully you heard that vocalization. And then the head toss is a way to look big and, you know, and scary to the hawk and to try to scare it away. Um, so if I could get the next slide, one of the things about sheep hawk that you might have noticed is that um, that sheep hawk that you saw in the video was in a tree. And sheep hawk live in trees most of the time. They're what we call arboreal. And um, and so they um, they like to eat the leaves and the buds that are at the ends of the branches of the trees. And um, they have lots of wonderful adaptations to help them access these food resources in the trees, um, including one of my favorites uh, when they're oh, and they like to um, they like to hang around and try to get different uh, foods at the end of the branches. And one of my favorite ones is when they hang upside down like a bat and pull the juiciest buds towards them. Um, and um, one of the things about being in um, a, a tree is uh, and, and, and eating leaves is you probably notice in these pictures that there aren't many leaves in on these trees. And that's not because they've eaten them all, but they live in a seasonal forest. And um, this is the dry season. And so during their dry season, it's their winter and it's a deciduous forest. So most of the leaves actually fall off the trees, just like they do um, in the U.S. during um, the autumn, the leaves fall and the winters don't have leaves. And so these are leaf eating primates in a forest where the leaves uh, fall um, and disappear during the winter. And so it can be a really difficult time for the shifak during these periods when there aren't many leaves. Um, but as a researcher, it actually makes it much easier to see them during the dry season and um, helps me get these pictures that you see here. Um, if we could get the next slide. One of the things um, about um, living in this forest is um, they have to find a place to sleep. And so they like to sleep in these really big, tall baobab trees. And um, so you can see this image of this tree here. And if you follow the area, the arrow, there's a little white dot there. And that is a ball of sheep hawk, um, or at least that's what I call it, is a sleep ball. It's a bunch of lemurs that are all huddled up together because this is their winter. And so they're huddled up together to stay warm. And, um, and so um, you might be wondering, why do they sleep in this really big tree in an exposed area where a hawk might be able to get them? Why do they do this? Well, they do it because of this picture that you see on the uh, um, on the screen as well, the, um, the FUSA. It's the largest predator in Madagascar other than people. And the FUSA is like a giant mongoose and they, um, they can hunt in the trees, they can hunt on the ground, they can, they hunt at night, they hunt during the day. So it's a real formidable uh, predator for the shifak. And so um, the shifak are only active during the day. And so 
they need to protect themselves at night. So they sleep in these really tall trees and the fusa are not able to climb this tree because the trunk is so wide. A person can't even put their arms halfway around the trunk of a baobab tree. And so um, the fusa can't climb up, but the shifa can't climb up this tree either. And so they actually have to jump into the tree from a neighboring tree. And you can see this tree doesn't really have many neighboring trees. So it makes it a great sleep site to protect them from the fusa. So, wow. That tree looks so isolated, hard to imagine how they could get from one tree to the next. How do they how do they do that? Well, they're vertical clingers and leapers. And I have a video of them uh, leaping. Um, this is a video of them um, leaping um, around the area of my trail. It's a little bit lower and um, on the ground. And you'll see them also hopping on the ground. And so they're great leapers. Let's watch the video and enjoy them um, hopping around. All right. So that, that was not a problem with the computer. That wasn't a glitchy video, was it? That they actually jumped sideways like that, like almost their their uh, the height of their body they jump. Yeah, they can jump really long distances. They have super long legs and um, and super strong legs, and their legs are so long that when they come down to the ground, they're not gonna walk um, quadrupedal like a cat or a dog. Um, instead, they uh, they hop bipedally like that, but their hips are not, their pelvis isn't shaped like ours, so they can't walk the way we do. So they do this hopping sideways down the trail and they're super fast, super fast. Wow, I bet they'd be really good at basketball and or ultimate, <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> so well, what are some of the major challenges facing the Shifa? So um, that is a great question. Um, one of the things that, um, if, um, if we could get the um, slide, the next slide, one of the things that um, I mentioned earlier is that they live in this seasonal forest, and um, and and they have to survive this time when there are, there isn't much food uh, because the leaves have fallen. Um, one of the things that um, they have to deal with is with that is um, making sure that they get in that the females get enough food to be able to reproduce. Some of my research has shown that. Um, what really matters for infant survival is not how much food a female has while she's nursing, but actually how much food she has before she even conceives the infant. That's gonna determine whether the infant survives or not. And that's because she, the females have to, um, they give birth and they lactate, they nurse during this dry season. And, um, and so they lose a lot of their body fat and they really suffer during this time. And then, um, and so it's already a really hard time for them to reproduce in such a, um, um, a, a difficult habitat, but they know the rains are gonna come back because it's highly seasonal. And so the rains and the food come back. And so they can, um, they can get, if they can just get to the rains, it'll be okay. But with climate change, what's happening is there's a greater frequency of droughts and the tropical storms and cyclones are much more intense. And so um, that uh, it, it's becoming much more unpredictable about whether those resources are gonna be there in the future. Uh, the other issue with uh, conservation be besides climate change is thinking about how nearly all lemurs are um, endangered, including the Shifak. And since Karindi Mate was established as a national park about 20 years ago, half of the forest in the park has disappeared due to forest fires. So they have the same sort of problem that we're having in the Western US right now with all these fires, especially with the increased droughts. And Madagascar is um, a very poor country and I work in one of the poorest areas of Madagascar. And um, there's not a lot, there's not electricity in this area. And yet the, the families need to be able, the people need to be able to cook their food, to boil water so that it's safe to drink. And so they, um, uh, they prepare charcoal um, from the forest so that they can actually eat and have safe water to drink. And sometimes the fires escape. 
and um, get into the national park. And, um, and so that's a real threat as well. Uh, but luckily, um, the good news is that um, we have this um, Antkua Chivaka Research Station there, and um, that's really beneficial for many reasons. One of the reasons you see is uh, my grad student, Dom Romanello here, um, working with an artificial uh, tree hole. There are some lemurs, especially the nocturnal lemurs, like to sleep in tree holes. And so what, um, what Dom has been doing is trying to put, uh, seeing if putting artificial tree holes in previously burned forests will encourage recolonization of the forest faster. Um, so research at the research station can really help um, um, with conservation. As well, um, the research station um, is a major economic engine. And so uh, we employ a lot of people and that gives them good salaries, health care, and um, opportunities to uh, really improve their lives. And, and so that's another reason that um, the research station can help with conservation. And then I have a picture here of Patrick, who's one of my research assistants. And I put this picture here because the other thing that it does is Patrick is from a, um, a, a local village and he um, has started, he's been working with me for a couple of years and he's so incredibly curious and has so many ideas about why the lemurs do what they do. But he's clearly a great scientist. And so one of the things that the research station can do is encourage people to get involved in science, um, people who might not have opportunities to do that um, in other ways. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is um, fund him going to university and becoming a primatologist himself. And so um, the Enkua Chivaka Research Station is um, has, and other long-term research stations have been shown to be one of the most effective ways at long-term conservation because it helps protect eco, whole ecosystems as well as works to improve the lives of the people in the area as well. Wow, that is really fascinating stuff. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, I'm looking in the, uh, the Q&A. Why don't we begin the Q&A session? Would you like to take some questions now? That'd be great. Okay. So, um, yeah, on YouTube and Facebook, uh, keep asking your questions. There's a lot of, these questions are better than the ones I'm asking, so let's get right to them. What I can tell you is that uh, there's more people asking questions from YouTube. So Facebook people, you have a little bit of work to do to catch up, and we're gonna, we're gonna assess the quality and quantity at the end, and there'll be more. All right, so the first question comes from Haley, and she asks, how and why did you become interested in this specific animal? That is a great question. I actually originally planned to do my research on bonobos in uh, what was called Zaire at that time, the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, because I'm interested in power dynamics. And bonobos have a very interesting uh, power dynamic between males and females. Uh, but at that time, it was not safe to travel to that part of the country. And so I had to figure out what else I was going to do. And I was looking for, because uh, that was the mid 90s, and so I was looking for other species and um, Diane Brockman was a postdoc at the place where I was in grad school and she works on this species. And she pointed out to me that, uh, and just convinced me that this is a great study species for my questions because I'm interested in social relationships and, um, and the social dynamics. And it's a very dynamic system. And the, but the main thing is that Males and females are the same size, but females are much more powerful than the males in terms of social power. And so uh, by studying the Shifak, I was able to look at more economic types of power rather than, um, rather than physical power and see how um, leverage influences social, uh, social behavior and social relationships as well. Wow, really interesting. I was expecting an answer. Your answer was going to be because they are so cool looking. But <laughs> it helps that they're super cute. <laughs> what a much better answer. Uh, yes. So the next question comes from uh, Maria. Have you had any problems with lemurs removing or trying to remove the tracking collar? Excellent question. And that is something that you have to be very careful about if you're going to put radio collars on animals. 
Um, luckily for me, the um, I, you know I've been I've actually been collaring uh, and working with researchers who've collared lemurs the whole time I've worked in Madagascar, and so we have a decades of research um, showing that the majority of animals don't really spend much time. They put the you put the collar on, and when they wake up, they kind of mess with it a little bit, um, but most of them just um, ignore it right after it's been put on. I'm not quite sure why. I, I tell them it's jewelry and that it makes them look very nice, but um, um, yeah, there are, there are a few animals that will kind of gnaw on it a little bit, but um, they mostly just ignore it. Um, and it's my job as a scientist to make sure that it does not interfere with their behavior and that they are safe. And so we regularly um, keep track of what's going on. And because we study them, my assistants and these other students and, and all these people are out there in the forest day in and day out watching them, we can really see if it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Negan, and uh, Negan asks, do lemurs lay eggs? Oh, wow. Great. They do not lay eggs. They are mammals, and mammals uh, give have live births. So, um, Lemurs are kind of primates, so they uh, they give birth, and they're, um, the, the whole process is very similar to the way humans are. Okay. Neat. Uh, this question comes from Emily. Have you noticed different alarm calls or different vocalizations for different predators? Excellent question. Yes, yeah. some primates like vervet monkeys, they have the leopard call, they have the um, aerial predator call, they have the snake call. The, the shifak, there's only been a little bit of work done on vocalizations in this species. So anybody who's interested in this question, this is a great species to study for vocalizations. Talk to me about it. We need somebody to do it. But what we know is that there is an aerial, um, there, there's a, um, a roar kind of call, um, alarm call for predators. And that's when a, um, a hawk is flying over and they'll do a mobbing vocalization. They all, rawr, 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 and, they, um, and it's a way to say, hey, we see you. Um, but then if the hawk, that same hawk is just sitting on a branch because the way uh, harrier hawks hunt in Madagascar is they hunt below the canopy. So when they're flying over, they're probably not hunting. But when they're sitting on a can uh, on a branch, really quiet, you don't want to go rah 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 because that's going to be like, hey, guess what? I'm right here. Come eat me. Right. So instead, what they do is they make this really quiet. And they slowly sink down lower and lower, so it's hard to get them. That uh, <laughs> shifak vocalization that I uh, that we played a clip of, that is something they do when there's a terrestrial predator like the fusa. They also make that call with um, in response to some other vocalizations um, that they make to each other. So um, it can have many different. Um, that one has many different uses. They seem really smart. I guess as humans, we should be proud to be affiliated with the same biological. <laughs> Next question comes from Positive Energy, who asks, Dr. Lewis, is the island doing a good job at conservation? And if not, how can we help? Oh, excellent question. So, yes, um, yes and no. So Madagascar has done a great job of creating national parks. Um, and so they have more national, more protected area per um, per unit of space on the island than we do in the U.S. So they've done a great job at creating protected areas, but they don't have a whole lot of money to patrol those areas. And it's a very, uh, as I said, it's a very poor country. And so um, people really depend on these resources for living. And so. Uh, a lot of effort has been put into conservation in Madagascar and people are really reevaluating um, how to go about it because some of the ways that people have been trying to do it have, um, have worked to a limited extent. One of the real successes is ecotourism because that then brings money into the economy and really helps people um, as well as the animals. And that's a key thing is you've got to help the people and the animals. It can't be just putting a fence around um, uh, the animals and saying and the ecosystem and saying don't use this we have to make sure that everybody benefits but then the problem with ecotourism is something like right now with covid you can't travel to madagascar and so madagascar's economy is very dependent on this ecotourism and then that's been taken away right now 
So how can you help? Um, you can help out in ways such as finding ways to help improve people's lives if they're organizations um, that um, really uh, work to um, help people find uh, um, uh, improve their livelihoods. You can, um, it, as I mentioned before, long-term research stations such as mine and there are many others across the island. That's a really great way to um, infuse um, money into the economy as well as give people jobs and to protect the, the forest. So um, those are all great ways. And um, at the end of this, you'll see a um, a link to my um, my website, and that's one way you can donate if you want. But there are other research stations as well. They're all great ways to to get involved and help. Great, thanks. Good information for everyone. This question comes from Sue, who asks, "I'd like to know the process protocol of their group movement through the forest. One goes ahead, then the others wait to see if it's okay, if it's safe, or." Excellent question. Yeah, it's really interesting because. Um, they'll all be feeding in, in one tree and somebody will want to go. And, um, but not everybody has the power to make others follow them. Not everybody's a leader. And so sometimes you'll have an individual who jump about five, 10 meters away from the food tree and they'll sit there and nobody will follow them. And they look back and they sit there and they'll make this vocalization. It goes, mm. and so they'll look back and go, mm. <laughs> and, and it's really funny and it's only when usually it's the adult female or one of the adult females decides she's ready to go that the whole group goes but the female has priority of access to the food so sometimes you'll have um, subordinate individuals such as the adult males or kids in the group they'll go ahead and try to guess where the female's going to go so they can get to the food resource and eat the food before the female gets there. But then sometimes they guess wrong and the female goes a different direction and then they get lost and then they have to call for the group. And that's when you hear that sheepock vocalization again is they're like, hey, we're over here. Um, dummy, why did you <laughs> why didn't you follow us the first time? <laughs> Great. Uh, this question comes from Skylar who asks, is there any incentivization for the government of Madagascar to protect the lives of lemurs? Yes, there's a lot of incentive, uh, incentives for the government. Um, um, <coughs> excuse me. But uh, one of the issues is that they've got, the government gets incentives from lots of different directions. So there are lots of international uh, or foreign companies that also want to um to work in Madagascar. And a lot of these companies are extractive companies. So where I work in Krindi Matei National Park, there's actually oil under the forest and there's oil offshore. And so whenever the price of oil, the price um, of a barrel of oil gets really high, then all of a sudden you see all these prospectors come and try to start thinking about whether they're going to start drilling in the area. And so there's, um, there's there's incentives for uh, the government to uh, protect the, the 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 forest and the lemurs th um, because ecotourism is such a major um, in, um, economic driver for them. But also they have other they have there are a lot of foreign companies with a lot of money and a lot of power to um, uh, that that kind of um, have a competing force as well. Thank you. This question comes from Nida, who asks are Shifak territorial. Ah, so, yes. Yeah, so um, I need to teach you two terms. So there's territory and there's home range. And a home range is just the space that a group uses. A territory is an exclusive space that um, a, a, a group uses. Shifak are not territorial in this sense. They do have a home range. They have a set area that they use. Um, and they um, and it really hasn't changed for a group. It, um, it really doesn't change much from year to year. They use the same area over and over again. Um, but they um, there's overlap. There's extensive overlap with other groups. And so it's not a mutually exclusive area. But they do fight with other groups to protect the resources in their home range. And um, and, and so in some ways, it's what we kind of think of as territorial. But in terms of technically that it's not mutually excuse exclusive. Great, thanks. Next question comes from Kitty Ninja who asks, question about lemur behavior. When my son was a baby, I was walking in the neighborhood with him in a front carry pack. Apparently neighbors had lemurs and they got loose. One looked at me and 
Well, I guess there's really not a question there, but maybe you could, <laughs> maybe you were supposed to follow the ball. <laughs> and jumped on your belly. <laughs> and that's how you had a baby. So yes, yeah. Shebok actually, um, they're vertical clingers and leapers and they have their, uh, um, so they have to figure out where to carry their babies. If you're walking around like a, a quadruped, like a cat or a dog, then you can have your baby on your back or on your belly and it's not in the way. But if you're a vertical clinger and leaper, then if you have your baby on your belly, then, um, and you jump up against a tree the way they do, their baby's head's going to get smashed up against the tree. And so when babies are young, like the ones you saw in the pictures, um, they actually carry them in the nook of their thigh, kind of between their thigh and their torso. And then when the baby gets older, they move and bigger, they move to the back. But when I've seen a birth and the baby comes out and even before it's finished being born, it, its hands are so strong, it grabs onto the belly fur and holds on for dear life. And so they are great at holding on. They don't need one of these baby Bjorn or any of those other packs. Wow, you saw a lemur being born. I know it was incredible. <laughs> wow. Oh, well, here's the rest. Eight questions later, Kitty Ninja finishes the question and the <laughs> jumped at me, gashing my leg. I've always wondered, are they aggressive? Was it because I had my son in a pack? I've never known, I've never known of any lemurs to be aggressive like that, um, or at least no wild lemurs. Um, I, you know, even when we um, sedate the lemurs and uh, they're waking up and we're releasing them. Or if they wake up before um, um, I've finished um, uh, working with them, they've never bitten me. And um, and we're out there right around where they are um, walking around in their space and they've never attacked any of us. My guess is if that sort of thing happened, it might be something to do with um, it being a captive animal that wasn't socialized in its normal way. Primates are almost all primates are highly social and gregarious. And they they don't, they really need to be with others of their same kind. They're not great, um, primates don't make great pets. They really need to be with other individuals of their same kind so that they can have that normal social behavior that they should have. Right, yeah, that makes sense. This question comes from Dean who asks, what have you learned about the culture in Madagascar, such as the people, the way of life, et cetera? What's it like being there? I love Madagascar. It's one of my favorite places in the world. It's the people are so beautiful inside and out. The culture is amazing. They're just such a mix of many different things. People only arrived in Madagascar several thousand years ago. And um, there's a mixture of people who came from kind of Borneo area, Indonesia. Um, the Dayak came over. I was in, I was actually in Borneo and I was in the Dayak area and I was listening to their language and I actually could understand a number of the words because this is where a lot of the Malagasy people came from is this area and they moved to, came by boats around to Madagascar. There's also um, Arab traders came and there's a mainland Africa people. So there's all this, this um, mixture of many different people and many different cultures. And it creates uh, lots of, there's many, there's actually different um, groups of people in Madagascar and each of them have a really unique, interesting culture. And it's just amazing. And they're so nice and just um, a very, uh, generous, nice, friendly people. And what have I learned? I've learned so many things. I have learned that I'm um, as I need to be much more generous and giving and open to strangers that I don't know. I, I think about Madagascar has this, um, or at least where I work, there's this custom that if somebody's traveling, um, then then you and they need food, you feed them. You invite them in and you feed them. It doesn't matter how much food you have you feed people if they are passing by. And um, and I think, oh my gosh, I, I don't know if I ever feed strangers who are just passing by, probably not. And so I think it's just um, a, a very, um, it, it's a very different culture and it's really um, just a beautiful one, just a beautiful one. I encourage people to go to Madagascar as soon as um, it's open after these COVID times, because it's just such an amazing place. Oh, that's great to hear. Uh, Max asks, have you ever gotten hurt while handling a lemur? Have I ever gotten hurt while handling a lemur? If I have, I'm trying to think if I have, it's because I've done something stupid. Um, they, The lemurs have never hurt me. I don't think I've ever been hurt in any way um, because the lemurs have never hurt me. And I have never, I, I'm usually, I'm sitting in one place 
working with them. And one of the things about, uh, well, I guess, you know, I'm thinking about the capture. I trip and fall all the time. And so that I have gotten hurt that way because you're constantly looking up at right. the, the lemurs in the trees and you're, you know, you're trying to write down what they're doing or now we have iPads <laughs> and we're trying to enter what they're doing right. in the iPad and you're looking up. And, <laughs> and so, you know, we trip and fall um, all the time. <laughs> or at least I trip and fall. The, um, my, uh, my assistants who grew up in this environment are much, um, they're, they're much less clumsy in the forest than I am. But also I'm short, I'm only five, four. And so um, I rarely hit my head on the, the, the branches because our trails are cut for to about six feet or so. And so I, at least I don't hit my head that way. I just trip and fall. Great, Rebecca, here's the last question from Stephanie. My kids would like to know what your favorite lemur is so far. Oh, that has to be the she fox. <laughs> okay. There's so many, you know, I love just about every lemur. There's so many amazing lemurs. The eye eye is crazy with its big ears and, and, and big teeth, ever growing incisors. They have teeth like a rodent and they have this funny little finger that wiggles all around. And then you've got the mouse lemurs, which are these cute little tiny things. And, and, um, you know, the injury are so majestic with their, their vocal, they sing in the forest and, and there's so many amazing lemurs. But the shifak to me are just, the Varro shifak are just, to me, they're kind of like marshmallows bouncing around in a forest. They're just these fuzzy um, little bubbles of happiness. And I just, when, when I see them, it just makes me so incredibly happy. So I would have to say the Varro shifak. Oh. Professor Lewis, thank you so much for a fascinating evening. If you want to find out more information about Professor Lewis's research, or if you want to see her full hour-long talk, Hot Science, that she gave several years ago, here's all the info. I know you all joined me in thanking Professor Lewis for a fascinating evening. Um, and everybody be well, and we'll see you at the next Hot Science at home. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Thank you.